please think of this as something to improve your writing or improve your appreciation of fiction. Uh, I really hope that you never have to use any of this stuff. <laughs> um, I know it. Yeah, so please, think of it like writing. It definitely comes apart in my writing. So yeah, think of it more that way. But, you know, who knows what the world's going to look like. Uh, I just want to go a little bit overview of what we'll be talking about today. And I would like to ask, please hold your question until the end. I will try to go fast enough so that you do have a chance to ask questions. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is I want to do a little bit of an overview of the apocalypse and apocalypse thinking and just what I think of that term. Uh, maybe a redefinition. Uh, talk a little bit about myself and why I'm doing this. Um, then I'm going to talk about the Go Bag, which is this backpack right here with a much more badass title of Go Bag um, as a framing device. And then I'm going to talk about the, especially for this area, what I think are the three most important elements is water, food, and uh, violence and protection. Uh, we go over some miscellaneous stuff and then end it with some recommendations and question and answers. Could, could we ask you to move slightly more to the side? Oh, Thank not you. a problem. Can you see now? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so let's get right started. I, I should mention, I'll try to keep it PG-13. Um, I have been known to cut curse at times. And I will warn you, it's not graphic, but there is a picture of animals being prepared for food later. So if that bothers you, so if you're fair vegan. Yes, yes. And non-traditional animals being prepared for food, I should point that out. Right. Dogs, um, cats, rats. One of those. OK, so that's the outline. So I would like to point out first that the apocalypse is notoriously targeted. Um, and if, if you didn't want to found your own religion or cult, the absolute worst thing for you to do is to predict an accurate time. Uh, if you're not familiar, last year, about May, um, there was a Christian sect in San Diego that was convinced that May 21st, 2011 was the day. Um, it, all the traditional stuff, members selling their crap, uh, buying billboards. Yeah, they, they actually convinced everyone to sell their stuff so they could do billboards and bus ads. He did it about 20 years earlier. Yeah. That's what makes yeah. it That's what blows my mind is the people who can do it successfully multiple times. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses famous because they thought that when they got 100,000 members, there would be the apocalypse. 144. Close enough. It changed. And, and it still changes because they have, they've had enough a couple times. Anyway. So the mm -hmm. apocalypse is tardy. Yep. I would like to bring up a better term of societal collapse because... Whether an apocalypse is realist or not, if we're doing literal definitions, I mean, it's the end of the world. It's not survivable. Nothing I'm going to teach you today has any matter if, That's right. I don't know, yeah. the and Earth blows up. I'm not going to teach you how to survive the Earth exploding. <laughs> <laughs> That's beyond my camera. Uh, but some of these things, and, and mostly what our notions of apocalypse are, is societal collapse. And I think that's a spectrum. Um, so a good example of societal collapse that's happened in our own lifetime is perhaps New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, these were people who were not able to get services that they normally rely on, and it was a traditional disaster, and certainly uh, things were reestablished, but it's about being without all the societal supports for either a short term or a long term. So that's what I want to focus on is societal collapse, uh, which, yeah, it's mostly what people think about the apocalypse. So here are just some realistic scenarios. Realistic scenarios I brought up. These are things that survivalists actually worry about, um, and some of mine. Uh, basically, I think that as we progress as a society, we understand that we actually don't do all that much individually that contributes to our immediate survival. Uh, we rely on farmers. We rely on these very complicated, very long supply chains. And as we live more urban, and as we have more division of labor. We're, we become increasingly aware of how vulnerable it can be. Um, so I don't think that, uh, say, agrarian farmers in the Middle Ages, they worried about Christian apocalypse, but they didn't worry about societal collapse in the way that we do, because they got everything from their local community. However, these are the realistic scenarios. These are the absolutely going to happen apocalyptic scenarios. I'm sorry to tell you guys, but uh, these things, they're... Face. I don't understand. Oh, a face heel turn is a term from pro wrestling tonight, and that's when the good guy becomes the bad guy. Because a good guy is a face, you know, the pretty ones, and a heel is the bad guy, the guy who does bad things. So if the Care Bears turn bad, wait, well, I'm sorry, not if, when the Care Bears turn bad. <laughs> They, uh, just don't have any 
Care Bears. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, uh, a program of genocide now against the Care Bears is really our only um, I would also like to point out that we've been worried about this stuff forever. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up in the zombie talk I did a couple days ago is this passage from the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you're not familiar, Epic of Gilgamesh is pretty much the oldest work of literature we have. Yeah. Uh, 4,000 written word, probably about 1,000 word oral tradition before that, and there's a passage in that where Ishtar, you don't want to piss off, gets pissed off, and she says, I will knock down the gates of the netherworld, I will smash the doorpost and leave the doors flat down, and will let the dead go up and eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. So, 5,000 years ago, they were telling stories about a zombie apocalypse. Um, so obviously there's something in us that we think about this stuff. Uh, another thing I would like to point out, lots of Romans thought that Rome was going to last 120 years. It was something about the eagles, the 12 eagles, and each was a 10 years. And for them, Rome was civilization. <laughs> but obviously it didn't. Um, and then also, I'd like to point out, in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, there is a, a verse where Jesus is talking to disciples, and he says, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, so, Bible scholars will massage that and talk about, well, it doesn't mean what it seems to mean. Uh, the medieval uh, Christians actually thought that there was uh, what they call a wandering Jew, that there was someone there who was immortal and who'd just been wandering the earth ever since. Um, so yeah, we've been worried about the apocalypse forever, and every generation thinks that they are the last. And, and exactly, and, and there is an explanation, but for medievals, they thought there was an immortal. It, it actually, it's a bad, it's a bad chapter break. Ah, oh, fair enough. <laughs> um, so, introduction to J.M. Perkins. That's me. Firstly, I would like to point out, and there's a couple things I'm not, and I've never been. So, if you have experience in these, it's not a joke, man. Apparently I'm funny, is what it <laughs> No, I, I've never been um, a soldier, a police officer. I've never had to hunt or fish for subsistence. And I've never been a resident of an armed militia compound, uh, which is, I think is what most people they think of when they think survivalist. Uh, so if you have experience in these areas, you've been trained for things, you've done things that I haven't, <coughs> and I'm up here anyway. <laughs> Uh, I would like to do a picture of where I grew up. I grew up in a city called Orange, which is in the county of Orange, about 10 miles from Disneyland. This is a picture of the circle. This is a mile from my house. I lived in a place called Old Town Orange. Norman Rockwellian, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, the houses are about 100 years old, if you're familiar. I will say, though, because they have basements, in the time that I lived there, there were three major meth lab busts within a block of my house. Um, really nice, but great for making drugs. Uh, so yeah, not the backwoods of Alabama. This is my boilerplate plate, um, because I was raised by survivalists, uh, but I'm very defensive of my parents. I don't like them being disrespected, and I'd like to point out first, my parents are great people. I love them, and I'm very grateful for how they brought me up and how they raised me, even if I do disagree with them on some things now. So I actually, I don't like reading PowerPoint slides, but I will read this one. My parents are kind, educated, warm, and giving. However, for the purpose of this talk, I should point out they are post-tribulation biblical literalists. This means that they raised me to believe, and they still believe themselves, that the Bible is a literal word of God, and that is to say it was written down by humans and proofread by God. He had various mechanisms to make sure it was okay. And uh, more to the point, that during the course of my life, our lifetime, it was entirely possible that we would have to flee the force of the Antichrist. Um, because the U.S. isn't really mentioned in revelatory prophecy, uh, Realistic scenarios, realistic scenarios, uh, is the U.S. would completely break down before that. So it's the Antichrist and or the destruction of the U.S. that would precede that. That's what they were worried about. Now, this is a sample birthday present for me, <laughs> uh, which I have this in my home right now. Uh, this is called a water bomb. And the idea is, is that this is a little water reservoir you put in your bathtub that should, uh, my dad's favorite phrase, is should the poop hit the fan. Uh, you would go to your bathtub, you would turn it on, and you would fill it. And you can definitely fill your bathtub just generally if, you, if it goes that way. This is to try to keep the water fresher. So yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I get on a regular basis. Um, and I'm not really honest. It just means that my parents love me more than your parents love me. <laughs> you were getting iPads and 
cool that stuff. Is entirely possible. I'm gonna survive <laughs> with my water bottle. You know, whatever happens, I'll be fine. Once you have a bathtub, you can running water to fill the bathtub in the first place. Yes, which I do actually. <laughs> So I found the dorkiest picture of me. Um, I, I, this is another slide I will read because I do want you to know that even though I've not been a soldier or a police officer, I have done some stuff. Um, I was asked one time if I was going to grow, grow up to be the next Ted Kaczynski. Um, I don't know what I was doing. Honestly, I think I was just protesting Radio Shack's old policy of getting your full address. Mm. Yeah, um, which again, I still have a problem with it. Probably not as much as I did then. But yeah, the, I guess the manager had just heard that complaint one too many times. Um, I have spent four days without eating. I don't recommend it. Um, I have performed self-surgery. I don't recommend it. Um, I have stayed up for three days straight, but with gamers, that is not impressive at all. <laughs> <laughs> A different crowd, they'd be like, wow, but you guys, are like, uh. um, Yeah, we play wow. Well. <laughs> I have had one of my teeth killed in a fight, specifically so this one right here. Um, I have baked and eaten cornbread out of a two-year-old 55-gallon uh, drum of cornmeal. I do not recommend it. Um, <laughs> you, you'll see some of these commonalities. I've hunted and fished and cleaned and eaten the things I've killed. Um, and not my dog, obviously, despite what this picture implies. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what really makes the picture. Yeah, that's what really makes the picture. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do think in, in just dog rearing that it's important that your dog is convinced it's a possibility you might eat. Yeah. Oh yeah. Don't try any of this stuff. Um, I have been robbed at gunpoint. Um, I have had the bones in my hands exposed after my foot got stomped on. And I can field strip and reassemble a Glock in about 90 seconds. But honestly, that's not that impressive. Um, any of you with about half an hour training could probably do it in a minute. They're very simple uh, as far as guns go. But it, it makes a great like. Yeah. Yes, I can do this. <laughs> but yeah, actually not that impressive. I don't um, so uh, my, this is the go bag, and this is what I'm going to be used to frame the talk. Uh, in this case, my go bag is a backpack, and in most survivalist systems or thinking, this is the linchpin. And the whole idea is is that if you ever need to leave, if you ever need to flee, whatever, you have a bag somewhere with everything that you will potentially need. So as the talk goes on, I'll be taking things out of my go bag and showing you. There's some things that I normally have in it that I do not have today. And I know. Well, I really didn't want to bring a gun. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, clothes are so boring. What, I'm going to pull out a pair of jeans. Ooh, survivalist jeans. <laughs> um, I also yeah, no survivalist. ammunition. Um, and no cash. <coughs> Although, if you're going to do go back, all of those are great things. The other thing I would like to point out, uh, they're also called bug out bags. For me, I really feel like anything you learn, anything that you care about, you should try to integrate as part of your life. So my go bag isn't just 